Hey, what's up? I got some more lore content for you guys. This week I'll be covering three decks that are amazing for climbing in the new patch. The variety cards just came out, and there is less than a month to climb before the next expansion and ranked reset. So trust me, you don't want to miss out. That way you have a good understanding of what's strong, whether you want to play the best decks themselves or if you want to know how to counter them. Let's see what these strong decks are, shall we? Welcome to Meta Report. And to start us off, we have a very strong contender from last patch that went quite under the radar, and that is Timo Yumi Elusives, coming in with a win rate of 57.12% and a play rate of 2.27% so far. It is doing extremely well. I do expect the play rate to go up, but the win rate to remain roughly the same. So this is a sleeper pick, and it will continue to rise as we play through the weeks. Its best matchups are Nora Bard. Lissandra Voli, Galio Voli, and also Lissandra Talia Thralls. The worst matchups are Darius Nar Overwhelm, Jax Orn, Jinx Echo, and also Kane Aatrox Cultus. So yeah, this was a very strong deck last patch, and it went pretty much unnerfed. Yeah, Divine Whirlwind got a small hit, but that was never really a focal point of the deck, so it's pretty much operating at full power. All it wants to do is slam elusives, right, and then attack with unblockable units, uh, annoy the opponent over the course of the early mid game, and then finish out with more elusive hits or with direct damage from P and Z. And starting us off, we have Acorn the Hex Technician, 1 mana 1 1, elusive of course. Nexus Strike, reduce the cost of the most expensive spell in your hand by 1. We're not really discounting anything too crazy, like we're not running Champion Strength in here because we're not in Demacia, but as long as we are hitting any spell in hand, we are pretty happy, because we want to use our mana primarily for just setting up units, making big wide boards of unblockable attackers, and then just shipping out some cheap and efficient damage later. Like, even if we're hitting Mystic Shot with this, we're pretty happy, because that's 1 mana Mystic Shot, maybe 0 mana Mystic Shot if we get multiple hits in. So, honestly, just a good, well rounded card, especially for the mana efficiency. Next we have Bird, the Bell Ringer, 1 mana 2, 1, really good turn 1 unit, can attack with it or block with it, it's so low committal, and then also you get a Chime on top of the deck. So if you draw your next card, the Chime will proc, giving a random ally in your hand, plus 1, plus 1. Obviously, elusive units love the extra stats because it makes them a little bit harder to deal with removal-wise, right? A lot of spells might not kill them anymore. And then they're also doing extra damage. So plus one plus one is just a really, really toxic trait for elusives to have, and Bird is going to abuse that. And next we have Pytos. We can use this in the early game to kill 1 HP units like Saboteur or something like that and just contest early boards, especially in the aggro uh, mirror match. It's really good into like Jin Annie in particular because Pytos can kill like a Crackshot Corsair. Then you can get a Pastry and that can kill a Saboteur basically slowing down the aggro strategy. What's really nice is that Perilous Pastry can also double up as face damage, so you can use this to like finish off uh, a blocker. Like, let's say blocking Badger Bear comes down and it lives with one, you can use Pytos to finish it off, then they no longer have the elusive blocker, and you have two mana, deal one to the enemy face, which can definitely come up because you need to get every little bit of damage that you can. This deck loves that. Even one damage goes a long way. And next we have Teemo, speaking of 1 damage here and there, 1 mana 1-1 one, one, Nexus Strike, plant 5 Poison Puff Caps in the enemy deck. We are not really trying to level Teemo, so don't really worry about leveling him up too much. This is not a Puff Cap deck, this is just an elusive deck that is using Teemo as one of its champions. But sometimes, if he gets like 2 or 3 hits in, A, the opponent will be taking extra damage whenever they try drawing cards. So it's really good against draw strategies. Things that want to draw a bunch are going to take like 3 to 4 damage on game per average, but you're looking at like, you know, Teemo hitting once and then they're probably going to take 1 or 2 puff caps over the course of the game, so that's really nice. He basically comes with a free mystic shot to the enemy face if you think of it like that. So overall, just a really good champion, and he's also annoying, and he's a must remove, so the opponent is going to have to invest in removal spells to deal with him while you're developing other elusive allies. Bonus points if you can protect Teemo, put Yumi on him, or put Heroic Refrain on him in the mid game, and all of a sudden, this Teemo is going to be a thorn in the opponent's side. Next we have Triple Kelp Maidens, <laughs> talking about thorns and sides. This card is really annoying. 2 mana 2 1 elusive, it is aggressively statted, so it is going to be doing a lot of damage. Next to strike, create a prank in hand. This is where it's going to start getting very frustrating for the opponents, because if you hit with Kelp Maidens, you can get a prank. Yo, Acorn might cheapen this at some point in the mid game as well, and then you can play prank for free. But just in general, if you play prank for one, I mean you're pretty happy, then you get to see the opponent's hand and also 
uh, make one of their cards really hard to play. Sometimes unplayable if you prank it more than once. This is basically just taking a card out of the opponent's hand while also getting knowledge. You get to look at two cards. So yeah, it's really, really strong. It's really annoying, especially if you get multiple pranks. Especially if you get Prank plus Skip King of the Reef, which we're going to talk about. It makes it really hard for the opponent to keep up with your pressure and uh, have the appropriate outs to deal with you because you're just making things cost more or you're making things not be able to block. Like, it'd be so annoying for the opponent if they have blocking Badger Bear and then you prank it with can't block. Uh, all of a sudden, they just probably surrender immediately and you just won a game straight off of Prank RNG. So yeah, Kelp Maidens is a very, very good card to play around. And next we have Triple Mystic Shot. Primarily using it to uh, execute the enemy Nexus, especially in conjunction with blowback or multiple Mystic Shots. You know, stuff like that. We can also use it as removal in case we need to shoot like an Annie or anything that's like super, super important to deal with that has 2 HP. Skip King of the Reef, a new card that came out in the most recent expansion. 2 mana, 1, 2, elusive, of course. Play. Pick one of two non-champion cards in the enemy hand. I capture it. So he just yoinks it. So just like Prank, you get to look at two cards from the opponent's hand. But instead of like giving it a negative effect, you just get to steal it. And it goes on to your skip. So they can't get that card back unless skip dies. So if you take something like Blocking Badger Bear or if you take a single combat, well, it's going to be really hard for certain archetypes or certain regions to deal with you. And you can also like prank a Mystic Shot and then you can skip and steal another Mystic or steal a High Note. And you can kind of see where the combos get really, really annoying. The opponent's going to have like two cards in their hand and then all of a sudden they're both going to be unplayable or one's unplayable and one's yoinked. So in conjunction with Kelp Maidens, this card is absolutely insane. You open multiple skips, the opponent just doesn't have a hand, and they can't play the game. So, really, really strong, like, side win con for elusives is actually just making the opponent's hand unusable or gone completely. So, that can be very annoying uh, for the opponent, but very strong for you, the elusive player. Next, we have Triple Sting Officer, 2 mana, 1, 2. He used to be a 2, 1, but this deck actually got him nerfed. So he's now a 1-2, which is still good enough to run him at 3 of. Nexus Strike, plant 2, Flash Bomb Traps in the opponent's deck. The Flash Bomb Traps might just like execute things or might uh, hurt the opponent's strategy. Maybe put something to 1 HP so he can finish off with Pytos. Pretty much like a flexible thing can happen where, I don't know, maybe certain units get certain damage and you can just finish it. And that's really cool. Other than that, he is just, you know, pinging the enemy face for 1 and then also pinging the enemy units for 1 whenever they draw the traps. So overall, just good card. Next, we have another very annoying card, Heroic Refrain. Three mana burst speed, give two allies plus two plus one. So that's a plus four damage to the enemy face. It's basically like Brother's Bond. For one more mana, you also get plus two health. So very, very good. It's actually better than Brother's Bond, in my opinion. If Acorn hits this, then all of a sudden you have two mana burst speed, give two allies plus two plus one. And this is going to be the cornerstone of a lot of your damage strategies and a lot of your pushes in the mid game. I've been in a lot of positions against elusives where I'm like, oh yeah, I'm okay unless they're on exactly heroic refrain and also like mystic plus blowback. And then I just die for free. And you know, it turns out that's exactly their hand. So this does come up quite often. This is going to be one of your essentially like finisher cards or like softening the enemy so that you can get to your finishes with your direct damage. So yeah, Heroic Frame, really, really broken. You probably want to keep this in hands where you see Acorn as well. Next, we have Octo Adventurer, a 3 mana 1 4 elusive, but it's also an explorer, giving this deck some flexibility, which is one of the things it doesn't need. But look, it gets for free on top of being an elusive synergy card. I don't know how this was planned out or if it was like thought out in advance, but it doesn't really seem like it. This is a very strong card. So it's a really tanky elusive. It's a really good target for Yumi, it's a really good target for Heroic Refrain and also gives us flexibility in most matchups. So we can do Explorer's Malfunction to deal with equipment-based decks like Kane Aatrox and Jack Zorn, which is our bad matchups, as you recall from the matchup section. But we can kind of maybe offset that matchup by just destroying a good equipment at a good time. You never know, that helps a lot. If you open multiple adventures, then they're just doomed. You can also deal with like Akshon decks when you can kill the Swinging Glaive with this, and it's just really annoying uh, to have this flexibility. Same with Landmark Destruction, you're fighting a Volibear, well all of a sudden you can kill a Sigil very very much slowing down the opponent's strategy and tilting them you can also turn off keywords so if the opponents have an elusive you can turn that off and then they no longer have a blocker for you you can turn off overwhelm maybe helping in that matchup as well and you also have heals for aggro or for uh, overwhelm matchup just being able to heal yourself makes you maybe not die to uh, damage finishes so very nice 
just overall well-rounded card. And next we have Yumi, which is basically another elusive unit. What you do is you attach her to one of your elusive allies and they gain the stats of Yumi. So it's a plus two, plus two boost. And then every round start, she also gives it plus one, plus one, which is absolutely criminal. So what happens is you like bird on one and then that hits like skip King of the Reef or it hits like Sting Officer or Kelp Maidens, right? So the chime is already hitting an elusive ally. You play them on two. And then you put Yumi on top of that. And then the opponent, if they have no out, are going to be very behind and pretty much lose from that position um, in most situations. So yeah, Yumi's really good. She's a win more card. You just slam her on an elusive unit that you're confident you'll get more value from and more attacks in with. But yeah, you do have to play her at the proper time sometimes. I think she's not like completely uh, brain off, but she can be. So yeah, Yumi's really, really, really strong in a lot of uh, certain situations, just giving more stats to your elusives. Next, we have Yep Clock, 4 minute 2-2, two, two, uh, elusive, of course, and play. Predict, draw one, reduce its cost by one. You're probably looking for uh, your finisher cards at this point. You want to hit Blowback, you want to hit Mystic, you want to hit Heroic Refrain, all that kind of stuff. Uh, super good 2-2 two, two body that also draws you a card and cheapens the card. Next, we have Triple Blowback. This is a direct damage finish. Think of it like Mystic Shot with a bunch of extra steps. You have to discard cards, and then you get to deal damage to the enemy face while also double dipping on unit damage. Very, very good card overall. Primarily a finisher, though. You want to use this in conjunction with multiple Blowbacks or like Mystic, and then just end the game that way. It's like um, Decimate and Fervor, that kind of deal. It's just like what Noxus Burn has been in the past, but like infinitely better because it's in PNZ region and you can like draw into it and you can make it cheaper with Yep Clock. So just better burn. And next we have Eye of the Storm, four mana burst speed spell that gives an ally two attack and also you draw two. So speaking of uh, draw and PNZ, we are going to be able to give our elusive unit plus two attack. And again, that unit is not going to be blocked very easily, so that's two free damage to the enemy nexus while also drawing two. Bonus points if you draw into your burn finish cards. So yeah, Eye of the Storm is very balanced, very good. And finally, we have one Divine Whirlwind. You can cut this for like uh, third Eye of the Storm if you want. Some players have cut Divine Whirlwind completely. The list that I'm using from uh, Runeterra AR has it at one, so I just have it at one in here. It's da uh, damage to the enemy unit, but also one quick ping to the enemy nexus. It has been nerfed recently. It used to be two free damage to the enemy nexus. Now it's only one, so feel free to drop it entirely if you desire. And that's it for the deck rundown. Now here's a live commentary game so you can see how the deck plays out. I'll be giving context to why I'm playing certain cards and hopefully it gives you a good feel on how to play the deck. And for the example game, we're going to be fighting at Lissandra Voli, which did get a little bit stronger with the inclusion of Bodir from the from the recent patch. So honestly, really good choice. We have Teemo on attack one, Sting Officer, Yumi for Teemo, Heroica Frame for later. I'm pretty sure this is one of the most unbalanced hands I've ever seen in my life. And it's literally my first game ever playing this deck. So that bodes well for us. And then Yep Clock on four. I don't know how this is chill. So let's play Yumi on attack one. I mean, not Yumi, Teemo. I'm getting way ahead of myself. We're playing Teemo on attack one, uh, getting in the free damage because they don't run Parley or anything like that, I would hope. And then boom, five puff caps into the opponent's deck. Maybe they'll take that later and get lethal that way. It would be kind of funny to get a puff cap lethal. Look, there's one right away. Teemo's already dealt two damage for us. Feels good, man. So let's play Kelp Maidens here. I'm a little bit worried about maybe Ice Shard, right? They could be hard running that. Maybe Sting Officer is a bit better. That way we don't get Ice Sharded immediately. And then we can stick Yumi on the Teemo. Maybe play around him. If we weren't worried about Ice Shard or like small instances of damage, I probably would have played Kelp Maidens and then Yumi that. Oh my god, another Puff Cap. This is so cringe. So let's go ahead and put Yumi on top of Teemo. Avalanche is not very good for them, obviously. Um, Ice Shard doesn't do anything. They're going to have to just be on Frostbites and start stalling. Arshwinds, uh, Three Sisters Flash Freeze, that kind of stuff. Otherwise, we're about to get very far ahead. Deluge, alright, that's a pretty good card. Now Avalanche is going to deal three, but our right, Teemo's going to get another hit in. Got more Puff Caps in there, got some Flash Bombs. And Yumi is going to keep buffing up this Teemo, so they're going to have to deal with him very soon. Because now he's a 4-4 round star, and he's going to be a 5-5 five, five, uh, for our next attack turn, which again is not very balanced, but here we are. Yep, Clock or Bird Kelp? Those are going to be the questions here. Lissandra, I kind of like Bird Kelp, just because I want to be able to prank them. I do think that 
We are going to get Ice Sharded though, so maybe it's best to just do Yep Clock and then do Heroic Refrain next turn, because Ice Shard's going to be through, uh, two damage at fast speed. Yeah, let's do Yep Clock. And then we can grab Blowback, one mana Kelp Maiden, zero mana Teemo. Uh, probably Blowback. Zero mana Teemo sounds funny. We could level him and stuff. I think they're just going to be on Frostbite. So let's not all in. Let's just make sure we have our consistent end game damage. We're taking two, no problem. Don't care. And then we're going to open. I hope they're just on Ice Shard and that's it because our Heroic Reframe is going to outplay that. So let's go ahead. Another Puff Cap. And a Flash Bomb. Times two. All right, let's open attack here. They probably wanted us to develop so they could Avalanche. Too bad I'm cringe. I'm not going to allow that. Now we have to see the three sisters or the Harsh Winds or an Ice Shard. Those are primarily the only options they have access to. Unless something really crazy happens. Ebb. Ebb deals three, so Horror Frame, not very good. On him, we could still do it. Although, if we do Heroic Frame on Teemo Yep Clock, then they have a new action to play Harsh Winds in case they wanted to play the slow and one at a time. I'm pretty content with just acccepting this, taking the damage, so no Heroic Frame for us. Um, if they tapped below five, I would do it, obviously. But I have to worry about maybe Harsh Winds as a um, an action in case they wanted to like bait something from me. We'll just take our guaranteed because we have lethal in hand with the uh, blowbacks. Low. Oh, never mind. They're going to heal. Up to seven. And heal again. Their options do not seem all that good. However, I'm kind of chilling. What if we do blowback right now just to kill Lissandra while they're uh, tapped to one? Pop. And we would discard the bird and probably the acorn to be honest. Just whip it out because our blowback is dealing three damage. Might as well kill Lissandra we have it. Yep, and we don't have enough mana for another blowback. So that they have seven mana to uh, deal with this. And I'm going to say good luck. Deal two. Um, Alright. Sounds good. Now what I'm going to do is Octo Adventurer. And then we're also going to do a landmark destruction just for fun. We're not going to use it though, probably. What I'm going to do is end up blowbacking it. Kelp Maidens. And then we're going to open again. And then we're just going to open again. And now Teemo has Spell Shield because Yumi saw it attack three times. This is so chill. This is a 1 mana 9 6 elusive Spell Shield Teemo. I don't know how we got to this game state, but here we are. Very balanced, I'm thinking. Yes, go ahead, ping off Spell Shield, then Harsh Winds. Or what? Nope, there is no combination of cards that gets them through this. Holy moly. And for the next one, we have one that I'm personally excited about. Get ready to bow down and kneel before your majesty, the Poro King. Coming in with a win rate of 54.87% and a play rate of 3.38%. Bro, the king has risen. Uh, get ready to slam some Poro King decks because it is doing very good right now. Its best matchups are Callista Nasus Slay, Lissandra Talia Volibear, Lissandra Volibear, and Jinx Echo. Its worst matchups are Jax Orn, Timo Yumi, which we just played, Vayne Gwen, and also Jin Annie. So the list is going to look a little troll. Trust me, there is some uh, rhyme and reason to the chaos, right? There is some uh, crazy stuff going on in here. We have two affectionate Poro, which is fantastic because that's a very good Poro. Triple daring Poro because that's fantastic. That's like the best one because it's elusive. Triple lonely because it generates... And then we have a bunch of weird one-ofs, and I can explain why this is. We have a random Plucky, a Pouty, a Proto, and a Sinister. Now, these are like the best Poros, honestly. Uh, we're not hard-running the Destined, the Nimble, the Plunder, or the Poro Fly, because we want to generate some of our Poros off of Lonely, and we just want a combination of like a bunch of different Poros. The reason for this is because this deck can be considered a Turbo Poro King deck. 
This deck aims to play a bunch of Poros and level the king by 5. So when he comes down, he is already leveled. So the way we do this is run a bunch of 1 and 2 ofs, the early game Poros, to really like mid-max the amount of different Poros that we draw into, if that makes sense. So in a lot of hand states, we're going to be on like 4 unique Poros and then maybe Lonely can create our 5th one. You know, stuff like that. So it's going to be really easy to play six Poros is his um, requirement. You're going to be playing six unique Poros. And this is the best way to do it. Poro King himself does not count for this. So yeah, you need to play six of the uh, early game dudes. And then when he levels, you get a special snack. And the special snacks are really, really, really strong. So as a baseline, all of the special snacks give the plus one, plus one, just like the regular snack. They're all one mana cheaper, but they also all do a bonus effect. So the Espresso does two poor allies, gain challenger. Frosted is Frostbite. Colorful is an extra one, one on the champions. So only Poro King and Yumi in here. And a keyword... And then Pepper is give Poro Allies Impact. Very good aggressive one. And then, of course, here's the base Poro Snack. You get these whenever you play a Poro after base Poro King. And you get a special every time that you play a Poro after he's already leveled. Or uh, on, on level up. So that's really cool. So yeah, we have all the early game Poros I talked about. Lonely Poro generates a new one. Very good. Then we have one of Targonian Telstone to Behold the Infinite. Hush or Blessing. These are all very useful in different uh, game states. Hush for Silence, Blessing for your elusive Poro. It's permanent buff, so it's not like round end. It goes away. This is nice. This is a nice permanent buff. You can do like elusive Poro, put Yumi on that, and then you're playing Teemo elusive Yumi essentially, and then Blessing that thing. So that's just a win con for us. You can also do that for Pouty Poro. This can be a win con too if you put y Yumi on him. So honestly, this deck can go a bunch of different directions. That's one of them. Uh, one random guiding touch to heal and draw. Two Pale Cascade to uh, give your allies buffs. This is good for combat or protection. Nightfall draw one. Really good too. Two Patch Poro Bot. Again, we want to run it at two of not three because we just want to maybe mid-max the different names. Patch Poro Bot comes down, gives a random keyword every single round from in hand. Doesn't really matter which one you roll, but there are obviously some good keywords that are better than others. Uh, Poro Herder, two mana, two, three. When I'm summoned, draw a Poro if you behold one. So if you have a Poro anywhere, he draws. Very high chance that he draws you a unique one or a lonely Poro, which generates. So all of which is really good. And he can also draw you the Poro King himself. That's a nice little touch that maybe a lot of people don't know. Poro Herder is a very high roll champion tutor in some games. So that's really nice. Um, love to see that. Triple Poro stories to generate more random Poros. Again, you want to be hitting six unique ones. So stories helps with that. Triple hard run Poro snacks to give poor allies everywhere plus one plus one. Really, really good in the early mid game and also uh, for damage finishes later because you can stack the snacks and you love to see that. Double Yumi, that way you can put her on any of your early game Poros, make them an alternate win con to play around if it comes up. And she's just good in general here. And then one fabled Poro, 4 mana 2 5. When I'm summoned, grant Poro allies a random keyword. You can hit just like random elusives, random quick attacks. Random life steals in case you're fighting aggro. You hit two Poros with life steal, you just won the game. So, really good card is also a unique Poro. Poro Sled, same thing, 555, five, five, really good card. Impact. This card's gonna be buffed up by the snacks, so gonna be a big dude. Summon an attacking random one cost Poro, that's also really nice. Um, little fun fact about Poro Sled if you attack with him and the king is on the board, and like let's say you're doing an open attack, so you haven't been able to play a Poro yet, the Summoned Poro from Poro Sled is going to proc the King's free snack, and that's really nice for combat. So, honestly, really cool little side note there. More synergy. Poro Sled, also unique Poro. Love that. Double Sunburst, because we are in Targon, and this is one of Targon's best cards. It is a silence and deal six if you play it first in the turn. If you don't play it first, it's just a deal six, but for the most part, you're going to kill pretty much anything you want with this. And then it also runs double Zolani. The reason for this is because it is a very consistent secondary win con. Really, really cool card. All of your Poros are going to be buffed by your snackage and then they die. So Zolani will gain 2-2 two, two for each time one of your Poros that are buffed up dies and become a big overwhelm finisher. If you manage to get it to Aspects Bane, it turns all of your Poros into uh, copies of itself. So it's going to be a bunch of like 16 attack overwhelm dudes. So yeah, just another like top end win con in case the king doesn't get you there. Zolani definitely will. And that's it for this deck rundown. Now here's a live commentary game so you can see how it plays out. And for the example game, we have Swain Volibear. 
which I think is a really good combination since Swain just got buffed. You can do a bunch of damage with uh, the Freljord side of things, right? With Avalanche and stuff. So really cool to get Swain like turbo leveled. Um, and then he comes out and helps. And then you beat down. <laughs> so that's going to be kind of fun. Sunburst is really good. I'm keeping one of those for sure. That way we can kill Swain. And we have Daring Poro and the King himself in our opening hand. He has graced us with his presence. Ah, we have Double Daring. So it's going to be a little bit harder to turbo, but that's okay. Maybe the first one dies to like Ice Shard, then we can redevelop the second and still get in damage. So overall, going to be a good pickup for us. Hatch 4 bot is going to be a Challenger unit on turn 2. That's pretty good. I actually kind of want to have Challenger on him. We buff him up and stuff. He can actually be a, a good threat to the opponent. Also gives us a nice open attack. That way we don't commit too hard into something and then like take Avalanche damage. So let's go ahead and open. That's three free damage, and then we'll play Pearl Stories. Right, let's see if we can hit some unique ones here. Sigil, yes. We do not have landmark destruction. So that is going to stick. We play Poro Stories and play out Lonely. Perfect. Oh my goodness. What a great card. And that hit Proto. All of a sudden, now we're just turboing. Wait a minute. Wait. Wait a minute. Our Poro King is leveled on turn five. This is not balanced. Nimble. Howdy. And. And, last but not least. Proto. And just like that, the king is leveled. And then we're going to open attack. And then play the king after. So let's go ahead and do bop, 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 bop. Take our six damage. We don't have any snacks, so. We're just going to do that. We're probably going to get hella avalanched here. No, we're not. Hmm. Well, maybe we still are after the Poro King. Um, it's a, it's a little scary to play the King here. If I beta pass, though, they're definitely going to accept it. They know something's up. And then they're just going to avalanche me later. I think it is just play the King now. Over the Lonely, I guess. kind of sucks we have to replace one. But it's not going to matter because I think my entire board's going to get wiped anyways here. I love that. The Fanfare Trumpet has sung. They're not even on Avalanche. Wow. All right. We have Sunburst, a Pepper Snack. Huh. Well, then I'm very happy, obviously. Fire Spitter is hitting our Daring Poro. We cannot get him out of that with Pepper, so I'm down to just let that happen. And then as soon as we play New Poro, we're going to be on Double Snackage. Am I going to play Sunburst, though? Yes. I'd rather Sunburst, that way that guy doesn't kill our king. I just realized. We could also Hush it, that way it loses Challenger. That's a little bit cheaper for us than using Sunburst, but I don't really have a reason to not Sunburst. Hush, save Sunburst for them, or I can just Sunburst now. I think we just Sunburst now, to be honest. No more uh, they're sending it. I don't want to damage my Poro King. I mean, I could put him in front of something, but I really want to snack this turn, so I don't want to be pressured to hush. Um, so I'll just take six. Whatever. Let's play Affectionate. Uh, I'm kind of worried about another chance at Avalanche here. Hmm. I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't really matter that much. I, like, I don't want my Daring Poro to get hit by Avalanche, so let's just leave like this. Play the affectionate Poro. If we get Avalanche, so be it. Oh, nice. Oh my goodness. We're going to double snack it up now. Let's go ahead and do uh, Espresso. Um, actually, are we threatening lethal and open? Let me see something. Aww. Down to one, huh? Because mm. I love to be able to threaten lethal and then play these after we get Harsh Winds or something. It doesn't look like we have that opportunity, so let's just go ahead and do Espresso and do Challenger this round. Bop. Um, uh, doesn't really matter how we do this, I don't think. Let's also give you Challenger for fun. Bop. And then put the Impact one like this. There we go, I think this does a little bit more damage, right? Cool. 
Uh, and then send it. Because now that's threatening lethal. So we'll go that route. Three sisters. And flash freeze. And then we will do pepper snacks. Which re-threatens lethal. Your move. <laughs> Let's go. That sequencing was very good on our part. Don't just slam double snack there, of course. Yes, and for the last one, I have to cover it. We have Lurk yet again. For the fifth time on Meta Report, it's a good deck. It will always be a good deck. It doesn't matter if Pike gets nerfed. Rek'Sai is OP. It's coming in with a win rate of 54.65% and a play rate of 4.1% of the meta. It's here to stay. Yes, its best matchups are dragons. Maokai, uh, Grave Printer, Volibear Aesol, which is unfortunate because everyone wants to play Voli Aesol after Bodir is being added to the game, and Trendomir Voli for pretty much the same reason. Lurk is taking all the fun out of it. Its worst matchups are Jinx Discard, Barrier Boys, that's kind of cool. Play some Barrier Boys into it. Jinx Cannon, so more discard. And also Zed Gwen. For the list specifically, I am doing the Runeterra AR version. It runs a whopping three, five, six, seven, eight non Lurk cards. Something I would never recommend because I am not lucky enough to always hit Lurk. I'm going to whiff a lot. Um, so I usually run like four non-lurkers and I still whiff. So this is going to be fantastic. It's the same list as usual, but it's got like a random round negation, which is kind of like the usual. So if you like lurk, keep it up. Deck is still good. You'll still win. Uh, yeah, here's an example game. And for the example game, we're going to be fighting an actual cool deck, which is one that I've been playing. It is... Nasus Callista Slay with the new self slay units, the Iron Hound and also the Dune Swallower, both very cool. Wow, look at us. We have Snapjaw Swarm and we're attacking on odds. We pitch Pike because we want the champions in the deck, unless we open Call the Pack. So he goes away. Great hand. We're attacking on odds. I guess we just high rolled. So we're going to Sharkling on one, Snapjaw Swarm on two. Wow, we also have Hatchling. Um, it doesn't really matter which one we play, they're both dead to Quietus, and yeah, I guess we play Ashling then. Maybe less things block it. Do we hit Lurk? Wow, we whiffed Lurk. Like I said, I am way too unlucky to run eight non-lurkers. Wow. What do we hit? Wow. Great. Snapjaw Swarm, let's hit Lurk. Nice. Rex side to make up for it? No. It is what it is. So we're going to do Bakai first action three and then decide if we play Sharkling or Hammer Snout and go from there. I'm just going to block it unless you're holding it back. OK, that makes sense. He's a bench unit, which is kind of weird. Uh, or we can play Caller first action. Nah, let's do Bakai because I really want the option to vulnerable something. Forsaken Bakai. Wow, this is balanced. Well, that makes up for the fact that we whipped it on one. And then grab one of these. They they got two sentries? Sheesh. That is an eensy bit ridiculous. We're going to grab one. And then attack, get Rek'Sai, and all of a sudden... The opponent needs to be very scared of this situation. We are now dealing seven damage to them. No hate spike or anything like that. Sounds good to me. They get to draw two, and they have nothing on their board going into turn four. Turn four needs to be their development turn. Okay, there's Bakai. They want to see, like, um, Undying. And, I don't know, maybe Wings and Wave? And then they're in a pretty good spot for turn five. Rek'Sai, Rek'Sai. Chemivorin, wow. Pretty interesting card. I raise you one Xersai Caller. And we're going to grab um, Call the Pack or Rek'Sai. I guess Call the Pack is like the same thing as Rek'Sai. It's pretty much the same thing. 
I think I'd rather have Rek'Sai then in, in our hand next turn. And then, no, no, let's just do Call the Pack. Because I don't want to play Rek'Sai. Uh, yeah, there's no way we can get the... Yeah, let's just do Call the Pack. Uh, we can Call the Pack Rek'Sai, to be honest. This as well. I think Call the Pack Rek'Sai is best first action into just a Camaborn Dragon. Because they have to deal with all of this with uh, six spell mana. So let's Call the Pack Rek'Sai. Nice. Uh, attack order, does this matter? Not really. Wow, I think we just won on turn 5, even if they block and play Vengeance. They will live with 1. That's the play. And they live with 1. Wow. Insane. We do not want to play Caller, by the way. It'd be so funny if I played Caller here, and then we just lose Rek'Sai. Play Hatchling out. And then we'd probably just play Dune Breaker. Um, we do have to worry about Ruination, maybe, if they float, so it's probably going to be Open Attack again. Oh, they're not floating. It is just a Susan, and Susan does not get to play the game. The opponent has surrendered in 5, 4, 3, 2... One. No, we're not surrendering. We're actually playing the game. That's impressive. Well, I'm not going to get castigated. I kind of refuse. But, but like, do I lose to castigate? Uh, kind of. Okay. Oh, and we hit Pike Spell. GG. Like, I don't want to give them a slow speed action there. One HP. <laughs> Yeah, wow, that was great. We basically won on turn 5. And that's it for this week's decks. Extra shout out to the patrons on screen, by the way. Much love and thank you for supporting. So yeah, to wrap things up, there is less than a month of climbing left, so make sure to pick up these decks or learn how to beat them, because they're going to be everywhere. What's cool is that since the meta is looking very similar to last patch, you should be able to play what has worked for you recently, except uh, Neela Janna, of course. That deck is in the trash can, along with most Janna strategies, so anything but her. This has been Meta Report. Thank you so much for watching, and have a good one. Laters.